Hi everybody, welcome to this session. This is the direct payment uh, session. I'm just going to go through some housekeeping and I'm sorry, I'm sure you've heard this now plenty of times before, but I'm still going to go through it again. Let me just start this from the beginning. Um, so again, if, if you're on the phone to somebody or somebody's trying to contact you to get into the session, there's still that number available. Wendy's still there waiting by the phone to help people. Um, a reminder as well that all these sessions are recorded. Um, so just be aware as anything you say could go anywhere. It's, it's public and, um, and I'm sure a lot of the sessions will be shared afterwards as well. Um, with the break and the lunch. When we get on to uh, conversations and next steps, uh, myself, Isaac and Sally will be watching out for you. Um, if you're not able to use the hand up or wave, try something yellow in front of the screen. It really helps us to see who wants to speak so that you can get your voice heard. We're keeping really strict time on the session, so the session will end at one o'clock today. Um, please stay on mute if you're not speaking um, so that we don't have lots of background noise as, as we're going through the session. And it's lovely to see your faces, so switch your video on so that we can see you when the slides are gone. It's lovely to be able to see people's faces. But of course, if you want to have a cup of tea or something to eat, you, you might want to turn your video off. Some Zoom basics again. People will know these two switches up here. If you want to go to the speaker view, press this one or the gallery view then where you start seeing everybody. And I'll be spotlighting uh, some of the speakers as, as they go through. Please you. Lost you. Oh, am I back? Yeah, yeah, got you. Lovely. So please do use the chat for any questions or comments. Uh, me, Isaac and Sally will be looking through the chat and we'll be raising them across and, and sharing with everybody as well. Um, and if you're having any sound problems, there's a preferences and there's a link there. So about this session, your facilitators today are myself, I'm Julie Stansfield, I'm one of the conveners of Social Care Futures. We're also joined by Marty Walker, so lots of people all know from TLAP or the Self-Directed Support Group. Uh, we're joined by Pat, Isaac, Sally, so them are the facilitators, but we're also joined by some great guest speakers who are going to be interviewed on their approach to direct payments. So our agenda for this hour is Martin's going to share what he's been doing, what we've been doing, uh, imagining the Self-Directed Support Group. Then Pat's going to interview some councils who are doing some great stuff on direct payments. Then we're going to have a think about, well, why aren't we all doing this uh, across the country? And then we're going to get on to next steps and what will help or what will be useful for the future. So I will hand straight over to you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. Uh, I'm off mute, aren't I? Yeah. Yeah. OK, thanks very much, Julie. Uh, great to be here. Uh, again uh, today, I had a great day yesterday uh, at the festival um, and yeah, today we're going to talk about the uh, future of direct payments. We think at TLAP there's a great future for direct payments um, and uh, we've been doing quite a bit of learning over the COVID-19 period, over the, uh, uh, the outbreak of the uh, coronavirus. And um, we've called it hearing the voice of direct payment recipients because in the early stages, they were really lost, we think. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Julie? So uh, at TLAP, as you might expect, we got quite involved very quickly um, uh, as different bits of guidance were being developed. Um, and uh, we noticed that uh, the voice of people with lived experience was pretty missing in all those conversations. Uh, it was pretty rapid. It had to be rapid. We understand that. It, it was easy for government to reach out and connect with the, the established sector, I guess, the, the trade bodies like UK Healthcare Association, Care England, whatever, um, were able to uh, connect with government pretty quickly. Um, there were, the voice of lived experience was missing in those conversations. Uh, but it became pretty clear pretty quickly 
the voice of direct payment recipients and their workforce, pers personal assistants, um, was was not being was not being uh, heard at all. Um, it, eventually, there was a uh, I think I was heard and um, action was taken to start to develop some guidance. So just to be clear, what happens here? Um, the, uh, the Office of the Chief Social Workers looked after creating the guidance uh, and they worked closely with the, uh, another bit of the department, uh, the personalised care policy uh, team, who support things around personal health budgets. So we quickly learned actually there were two bits, bits of the department working together here uh, in developing guidance. Uh, and it was very much an approach of this is what we've written, please comment uh, and we need to get your responses by yesterday, please. Um, it wasn't very co-productive uh, at all. Um, so we thought there was an opportunity there to say, uh, to, to say that to government. Uh, actually, the voice of lived experience, particularly the voice of direct payment recipients isn't being heard. Uh, and you could do perhaps a better job in, of co-producing uh, what you're doing uh, uh, by hearing those voices. Can we have the next slide, please, Julie? So I think we'd all agree publication of some guidance was welcome, but it was late. Um, and uh, as we were as we were sort of getting together with one or two people like Julie in control in making some fairly rapid comments, we started to spot some sort of key issues, really. Um, and and you can see those that we've we've highlighted. Um, Communication uh, and assurance from councils for direct payment recipients um, was very, very patchy. Um, and unfortunately, it seems to us still, still remains patchy. Um, the issue about uh, personal assistance, about key, key workers, uh, and as such, getting PPE, that, that was a big issue uh, at the beginning. And it's still patchy. Uh, and the approach of different councils is very, is variable, very variable. Uh, up, up and down the country. That, so that I guess that was the, the two things we were doing. We were interfacing with government. We were trying to pick up what was going on around the country to feed, feed at least some issues in an early stage. This, this issue of flexibility of budgets and, and staying safe. So we saw so quickly that lots of families said, actually, I don't want people coming into my home. So those, those and, and we can't access day services. So what do we do with our budgets? So, um, so these things came through quite quickly. Uh, there's no real way of sort of letting government know easily that, that stuff. Um, so I have to say, for us, for me personally at TLAP, it's not usual for us to interface directly with uh, government uh, civil servants. Um, an opportunity came along. It felt like the, the right thing to say, well, why don't we try and co-produce this better when there was a, 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 a call for maybe We've got some guidance out, but let's let's up, let's update it straight away. Uh, and we were quite surprised that that that, that offer was taken up. Um, so I've been I've been thrown down the gauntlet. Um, we um, we went about trying to convene some people. Uh, it wasn't perfect, I'm sure, but we at least tried tried to convene some people so so we could get get uh, a good conversation going with government co-productively. So we talked to, to Julie in control, we talked to Disability Rights UK, we talked to Skills for Care, and we talked to the London Self-Directed Support Forum and built around um, um, direct payment uh, re recipients within the National Co-Production Advisory Group. So people with that lived experience uh, being at the heart of, of the conversation. So we've got a weekly conversation going. Uh, could we have the next slide, uh, Julie, thanks. So um, we've been really pleased that that group has developed a, a real sense of energy and we've been meeting weekly uh, since uh, late May uh, to talk to um, people, uh, the chief social workers and uh, Gareth, I think I saw, Gareth might have joined the call actually, um, uh, the uh, personalised care um, policy leads uh, to help them. The idea was to help them to shape the guidance to make sure it was um, it was fit for purpose, and that fit for purpose is actually uh, being really useful for direct payment recipients and their workforce. 
it's all been revised now. There is a draft um, waiting for publication. I'm going to have a re-look at that because things have changed very recently, haven't they? So I'm going to have a re-look at that this afternoon to make sure it's all still stacked up. Um, it was, um, we, we provided uh, feedback about formats and uh, key messages. Uh, I was really pleased uh, personally that one of the things we got out was this seven bullet pointed key messages. And we know that in some places, that's been used by direct payment recipients to say to their local authority, look, this is what you should be doing. Um, uh, we were really pleased that uh, there was a recognition the winter plan should come to the group to make sure that key issues for direct payment recipients in the winter plan were addressed. Uh, and then we started to see actually connections being made across government uh, by the civil servants involved to say, look, we've got this group, you could bring your issues. And one, one, one really good, we've got three flu vaccinations. They actually approached us about that. We want to you know, make sure that personal assistants are, are clearly identified and, and can get the back flu vaccination at an early stage. Um, and, um, oh, thank you. Uh, another example was the um, uh, anti, uh, antibody testing. Uh, they came to us to talk about um, the way they wanted to promote that to personal assistants. Um, and then the really interesting thing that the even more interesting thing that happened is actually there was an appetite for those policymakers to, to talk about not only um, getting guidance right for this, this time, but actually thinking about as we move out, it would be nice to think we, we what, what, in spring, hopefully, when there's a vaccine available, when we move out of the, uh, of the uh, coronavirus uh, infection, um, that uh, we start to think about learning lessons from the period and uh, addressing policy to make sure that uh, direct, direct payments work in the way they were intended. So throughout that, uh, th that time, we've started to have conversations about what's, what's working and what's not working with direct payments, uh, both pre and during, during the COVID outbreak. And those conversations, I don't know if uh, Catherine from West, West Sussex is on the call. I remember Catherine talking about, well, we seem to be talking about this for the last 15 years. It feels like we're on a, we're on a bit of a, uh, a hamster wheel, you know, and can't get off. Um, we kind of know what's not working, but we don't seem to be able to get past that. And that kind of, we boiled this down to actually, there are some big questions. If you ask those big questions, different people in the system have different perspectives about the answers to these. And we kind of thought we got these nailed uh, initially when self-directed support uh, came in as a, as a policy and a process. It started off as a, a vision and, and uh, in control, within control, and that's been embedded within the CARE Act. But actually, when you ask people, in terms of a direct payment, whose money is it? You get different answers from different parts of the system. Who's accountable? You get different answers from different parts of the system. Can we make things more straightforward? Uh, I see my colleague, I'm gonna say this, Tim. Uh, I see my colleague, Tim, uh, is on the call uh, from, from TLA. And when I kind of first phrased that, I did phrase it as, can we make things any more difficult? Um, uh, but uh, that's, that's about process and trying to make process more straightforward. And then there does, does seem to be this question that I would say we do need to challenge around, is do, do practice, practitioners actually believe in self credit support. And again, there's a bit of a, a sense of um, some practitioners, uh, it, it's really difficult to understand whether they, they do believe in it or not. Some, it seems, are feel trapped by the system, would love to uh, fully empower people to take full control of their budgets, but feel a bit constrained. And then there are others uh, who uh, uh, social workers out there who are, who are championing the cause. So that's, that's the sort of work that we've done uh, in the group. Um, where next? There is a session tomorrow. I think, Julie, you might be touching on some of this tomorrow with, with uh, uh, Trish around power and resetting the deal. So we think we, think we, we might need to actually reset the deal um, between people, the citizen and state, um, to get the, if we can get the answers to those questions, can we reset that, that deal? We've lost a little bit of terminology uh, moving from uh, the uh, direct payment re regulations 
uh, as they were into uh, into the Care Act and that sense of um, uh, well, Julie, the term's gone. Um, uh, in lieu of services, making a direct payment in lieu of services. That bit's got lost, and the and 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 the intent of uh, what, what should happen with the direct payment, and that, therefore the flexibilities and you know a light touch of, uh, approach to uh, auditing, etc. It's got a little bit a, a, a little bit clouded. We think we're doing some work to, to, to describe what good and, uh, what what good looks like, what it doesn't look like. One of the asks of, of, of uh, uh, policy leads at the department was, "What can you tell us what good does and doesn't look like?" Um, uh, and we're looking at uh, some work with the LGA to um, the department. Noticed during uh, the outbreak, there was good stuff happening in terms of actually, can we just cut out all this bureaucracy and just get on and do things. So there's a sense that the department wants to support and continue that. And we think there's a real opportunity we could, we could uh, offer some work around that to see if we can do, uh, do some uh, uh, work to try and fo with a focus on that finance and monitoring and audit area to, uh, to make progress uh, with the direct payment offer that many places uh, uh, make to their to, to their direct payment recipients. So that's what we've been doing in the group. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by Pat Stack, uh, who's the chair of the London Self Directed Support Forum, um, and Pat is going to um, talk to uh, a couple of directors that we've got with us: Denise from uh, Tower Hamlets and and with um, uh, Jackie from Medway. Uh, and some direct payment recipients from uh, uh, certainly from uh, Town Hamlets. So, Pat, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Um, good morning, everyone, or, uh, or good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you, Denise. What I'm going to do is ask you a question, and then I'll put the, put a version of that question to. Uh, our second guest will be Mike Smith, the DP, a D, who's a DP recipient and the CEO of Real, the disabled people's organization of Tower Hamlets. So uh, if we start with you, uh, Denise, early on, we heard that there was very little communication with direct payments recipients about the support that councils were providing them. Could you tell us what your approach was on communication with people? Thanks, Pat. Hi, everyone. I'm Denise. Really frustratingly, my camera's not working, so I hope you can hear me well, but you can't see me. Um, and thanks for the question. Yeah, I think um, what we did in Tower Hamlets was we worked with partners, in, including um, Real, our disabled people's organisation, to understand what the potential issues were likely to be during the pandemic. And I think we did do that very speedily in Tower Hamlets and, and we were pleased that we, we did that. Um, we got information onto Reels website, onto our direct payment support service providers website, and then later onto the council website as quickly as we could. And we also wrote to everyone um, who has a direct payment in Tower Hamlets. And I think because we co-produced the work from the start, that we were sure that that was, we wrote to people in an accessible and understandable way, which was important to us. We included a, a broad range of information, quite a lot of it practical information about personal assistance, PPE, flexibility, testing, um, and contingency planning. So I'm sure Mike will expand on that, but I think I saw, we, we did move pretty fast on that and it was important to do so, I think. Thank you very much. Mike, can I ask you, how did that work for you? Did you get the information you needed and how quickly did it arrive? Um, yeah, I guess I'm speaking as both a direct pay payments recipient myself. I've been on direct payments for about 15 years now. Um, but also as the organisation that until relatively recently ran the direct payments board service and also uh, we provide information and advice to disabled people in the borough. But what was great was that because we already had a good working relationship with key officers in the council, we were able to flag up the issues that we were picking up both locally but also on those national 
discussion forums that were popping up on Facebook and elsewhere. And we were able to collect connect the local, the London-wide and the national issues and go straight to people like Denise and her colleagues and say, there were, real, there were big holes in the local, in the national gardens. People are feeling really unsupported. We need to work on it. And what was great is because we had those solutions, we, sorry, those connections, we could raise the problems and jointly create solutions. So everything Denise just said is true. We also got them to adapt a number of the ways in that direct payments policy was working. So they relaxed the rules on how you could spend the money. They gave a 10% increase in direct payments budgets temporarily in case people had additional needs. And they said that they didn't need to pre-clear how that was going to be spent differently. They were just, um, they were just uh, uh, you know, going to check on it in the subsequent monitoring. Um, we uh, had relaxation of the rules so that people could temporarily employ family members if they need to. Critical, I think, for me was an absolute commitment from the local authority that if people temporarily withdrew from services because of fears around catching COVID, that would not be used as an excuse to reduce their package of the next uh, round of um, recruitment. And we were able to get that information out on our website, on our social media, and as Denise said, in printed format for all those who are digitally excluded. And I think what we've done subsequently is tried to look at the number of issues that came up at the advice service, uh, and the issues. And there are virtually no reported cases of people in crisis situation as a result. So whilst you can't prove a negative, we really think that by working together so quickly, relaxing the rules, getting the comms out of it, we were probably able to forestall the kind of, some of the problems that I've seen reported around the country so much. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Denise, we heard stories of care workers not being able to use super supermarkets at times designated for key workers and that they weren't allowed to use public transport because they weren't able to show easily that they were care workers. What did you do in your area to make sure this was addressed for personal assistance? Yeah, this was an issue in um, Tower Hamlets. Uh, so we created a letter that personal assistance could use. It was on council letterhead, so a physical letter people could take with them. And that was to use when accessing shops, supermarkets and travelling on public transport and again we sent that out to people and then I think if people needed additional copies of that we we made them available. Lovely thanks and Mike uh, what did you do about your own PAs and have you heard what other areas what others in your area did did you encounter these issues and did the council's arrangements help? Well yes I mean I don't want to steal Denise's glory but it was us that suggested the letter and they originally gave us a template that was non council head registration. And we said, we don't think that will work because anyone could write that. So they then, we helped them re redraft it, you know, did the, it got the right wording on it, you know, asked a few people, is this what you need? So we changed by getting the council letter right early. Again, we were able to preempt the issues. And what we're also able to do is, get it mailed out to people, say that, and then here's who to contact for um, extra uh, copies if you need it. Um, so it was really good. And what what I was doing at the same time, there was um, there were a couple of Facebook groups that had been set up, uh, The Bunker and uh, uh, another one, um, and I was able to share the ideas of it to other parts of the country. So they were, you know, trying to say, well, if Tower Hams can do it, why can't we? And at least, uh, hopefully, a bit of small change happened around the rest of the country because I got the sense we were ahead of the curve. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Denise, we know access to PPE was a big problem for a long period at the beginning of the outbreak, and it continues to be a topic of hot debate. What did you do to make sure direct payment recipients got the PPE they needed? Yeah, it's still a hot topic, certainly. Um, so we made PPE available to people with a direct payment as soon as we had set up 
our kind of mutual aid scheme for um, personal protective equipment in the borough. Um, and to start with, we created a sort of... Hello? Have we lost Denise? Denise, have, are you still there? We seem to have lost you. She's got on mute. Denise, you're on mute. <laughs> Well, right, I'll, I'll finish the rest of the answer while she recovers. <laughs> um, yeah, again, right earlier on when PPE guidance was coming up, what I think what Denise and I forgot to mention was that we set up like a task force of local public council officers, CCG officers, uh, us at Real and the Direct Payment Support Service, and we, we were initially meeting on a weekly basis on a Zoom call and later on a fortnightly where we were identifying the issues that people experience, were experiencing and, um, and creating solutions to them. And the issue PPE came up fairly early on. And what the task force then did was work a process for getting it to people uh, uh, where people couldn't go and get it themselves, saying that maybe they could use that direct payments increase to pay for a taxi to collect it for them. Um, uh, we got specialist, really accessible guidance videos um, on uh, how to use PPE that disabled people could access and show their PAs. Um, and then the interesting thing, the, the extra thing was, we're still actually working on some of this with the CCG, but a lot of the guidance on PPE is how you, how else, like as quote unquote carer um, or PA protects themselves uh, by using it. And we were saying, well, oh, hold on a minute. Yeah, we're direct payments recipients. We're the, the allegedly clinically vulnerable. How do we protect ourselves from these people coming into our house? And we were by that, we were trying to develop a, a risk assessment process that disabled people could use around when and how they wanted um, the, the protection from their um, from their PA. So we then put extra guidance up uh, alongside the PPE guidance around, you know, extra measures you might want your PA to do to keep you safe. You know, for example, take a shower when they first arrive or wipe down surfaces that they've touched on the way in. Um, so it was, it was a mixture of the PPE and the guidance. And then in parallel, we did a bunch of work around where are the local shopping facilities and which ones and keeping the information live and current and local. Um, and we've done subsequent work similarly on things like uh, coronavirus testing, uh, antibody testing, where and how and when to get your flu jabs and so on. So I think it's just been this ongoing journey of what's the issue? How do we co-produce the solutions and then get them out there quickly? Okay, thanks, Mike. Are you back, Denise? Can you hear me, Pat? Yes, I can. Was there anything Great. you wanted to add to that? No, that's that's really comprehensive. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> okay, I've got just a slight supplementary for you. Um, how about shopping and other things like collecting medicines? What what arrangements were put in place for things like that? Denise? Is that for me? Yeah, please. Yeah, we, I mean, we had a backup uh, for that in the council in that we'd got a, a system in place with our primary care colleagues that could be accessed by our council helpline. So if for any reason people's arrangements for that fell short in any way, there was a kind of fallback position. But um, Mike, I don't know if you want to comment on that too. Well, I don't so you also had a team of people that were phoning and contacting all the people that were clinically extremely vulnerable and making sure that they had access to food, to uh, med supplies, and as well as providing some additional guidance to the court, both you and us were also redirecting people to the other mutual aid support opportunities that were there. So it was joined up with the wider third sector too. There was, um, there was a local uh, not-for-profit called Bike Works and they were getting yeah people linked up with people who could cycle and connect people's meds for them. There was uh, a range of uh, food delivery things that were set up alongside. So I think it was a three-way approach between the council, the additional support, and the, that they did for P 
people who are clinically extremely vulnerable, then us on the information, and then wider connections with the local, uh, our whole raft of um, community-led projects, and especially in an ethnically diverse borough like Tower Hamlet, where 48% of the population are, are Bengali, um, you know, really making sure that there were culturally sensitive approaches as well, so people were getting access to, you know, halal meals and so on as well. Lovely. Thanks, Mike. Uh, what I'd like to do now, I've, I've got more questions uh, for, for both Denise and Mike, but is to ask the questions we've already asked them now to Jackie Brown, who's the Assistant Director of Medway. Uh, and I think also we have Kathy Harper, who's the DP team manager in, in Medway, who may also want to come in. Uh, Jackie, you've probably heard the question already, but early on we heard very th th that there was very little communication with recip DP recipients. Could you tell us what your approach was on communication? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, in Medway, we started the um, preparation work prior to lockdown um, by assessing needs and identifying what was needed. So we were sort of half prepared. So as we knew things were moving forward, we started that preparation. And then Kathy and her team contacted everybody by telephone, so all the employers, to assess what their vulnerability would be if their PAs weren't able to work due to COVID. And we sort of introduced a, 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 like a, I suppose, like a red light system, a traffic light system for people who totally relied on PAs for support and had no other family or community networks. Um, we also gave employers information about how they could get PAs tested. So we were trying to get as much information out there as we could very quickly. Um, the empl the um, employer's insurance provider sent regular updates to all employers um, so that we got the changes developed. And then we made welfare calls to all, uh, all, all, sorry, all direct payment recipients, and that included carer direct payments. Um, everybody was given the um, Kathy's team um, the telephone number, so our duty number, and that was manned from uh, nine till five Monday to Friday. Should anybody require any assistance, and then that meant effectively that the coordinators were there to answer questions that they had regarding PPE or. Um, employment related questions so we started things really quickly um, and, and, you know in an attempt to make sure that that communication started early uh, in an attempt to stop you know any potential issues. Brilliant thank you very much Jackie. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, have you got anything you want to add? Yes I just wanted to add to that because um, I, I think it was very important because at the time things were moving really really quickly I mean every day there was sort of kind of new information new guidance coming down uh, from government so I think um, the, the thing that was that was imperative and was key to everything for us was having that one point of contact uh, one number for them to call that would be able to answer all their questions so to enable the coordinators to do that effectively and give the right information um, internally I, I used to have the first half an hour of the day um, with a team meeting to update them on any changes from the day before so it didn't matter what coordinator picked up or was on duty they were able to answer their, their questions and respond very quickly to that um, so I think that's probably um, are we, I mean, we did everything else but mainly we did a lot by telephone because um, what we found very quickly when we were talking to people is that people needed to speak to people. They were so worried um, and they kind of, um, I mean, these calls weren't, weren't quick, I have to say, because people, as I said, needed to speak to people. They needed to sort of share their concerns and we needed to reassure them. But it was worth the investment because I'm hoping this time around, that actually they know what the support was in place and, you know, and they're not going to be as frightened this time. But definitely the one point of contact was key in the communication for people. Lovely. Thanks, Cathy. Jackie, on the question of uh, PAs being able to use public transport, uh, being allowed to use supermarkets uh, and stuff, what, what did you do in your area to make sure this was addressed for personal assistance? So it, it was it's, it's very similar approach to um, Denise in, in Tower Hamlets, Pat. So uh, mm. uh, we provided a letter to all the employers um, for the PAs to use. It identified them as essential workers. We did that in partnership with our health colleagues where they were joint funded package, so packages. So we wanted to make sure that we covered all aspects, but it effectively pretty much the same as Tower Hamlets. Brilliant. Anything to add, Cathy? Yes, um, we also, um, uh, where obviously people needed to um, 
travel to work by public transport. We offered um, that people were able to use their direct payments to fund other modes of getting to work because it was important for their safety um, for twofold, really. You know, they're putting be more at risk maybe on public transport if you've got someone that's shielding but still needs their support. So we was very flexible in the use of direct payments around transport. Okay, thank you. And Jackie, on the the hot topic of PPE, <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, what did you do to make sure the direct payments recipients got the PPE they needed? So Cathy and her team were very innovative around this because of knowing the problems there were and, and seeing all the emails flying around the organisation around PPE everywhere um, and basically worked with, um, with a group of people and created a pool budget in a managed account and sourced our own. You know, I mean, it would have been grand if we'd have been getting things through, but we needed to do something quickly. So um, as part of the initial assessment I talked about earlier, we identified who required PPE, how much that cost. Um, and then we've got an SDS coordinator who was and still is, unfortunately, going forward, um, responsible for stock levels, coordinating and distributing the PPE to customers as they required it. Um, the, the, the stock was purchased from um, private companies and then eventually we were able to source it through our resilience forums. Um, but, yeah, the, uh, it, it was tricky, but, we, you know, the guys, yeah. do a, they do a brilliant job. Um, and I think just the question that you also asked earlier to Denise about, um, you know, shopping and so on and so yeah. forth, exactly the same. So our public health team worked with the voluntary community sector. Um, we identified all vulnerable clients and also people in the community that might not have received support from the, ca the council, but actually we knew needed that support um, and, and they were supported by food parcels, et cetera, being delivered. Lovely. Anything to add, Cathy? Not really, apart from I don't particularly ever want to go back to that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Denise, if we could come back to you. Um, the guidance Martin was talking about promotes flexible use of direct payments. How easy was it to get practitioners and finance people behind this key message in your area? Did you think this was the right thing to do? Or is this business as usual anyway for your teams? Thanks, Pat. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, lovely. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, as part of the letter, Mike and I described earlier, we um, we made available an additional 10% contingency to everyone with a direct payment. Now, actually, we do build contingency into our support plans and direct payments anyway, but we wanted to reflect the fact that there was so much uncertainty People were clearly going to have unforeseen costs and we wanted to make sure that we, we reflected that really so people had a bit more um, reassurance of sort of keeping themselves safe and, and, and well. I'm 100% sure that was the right thing to do. Um, and actually, internally, we didn't encounter too much difficulty around that. And I think we were able to put that in place quite quickly. And it was the quickest way to get extra resource to everyone so that they could um, use those flexibilities, really. So the sorts of things people use the flexibilities for, some of them have already been mentioned, but um, using uh, more family member support, um, collection of PPE sometimes, certainly travel, travel by taxis, different ways of um, personal assistance getting around, additional agency costs in some cases, and, and some people also bought additional PPE. Um, I mean, obviously, their, their choice to, to do that. Um, I, I think, as I say, it was definitely the right thing to do. I think there is learning around using direct payments uh, more flexibly that we can use to promote good practice. I mean, there is often finance, audit, anxiety about direct payments. As people know, there are lots of issues that still crop up. It is a balance. Um, those questions actually in Martin's presentation about whose money is it, who's accountable for it, and the processes that need to be in place. But I'm really clear. I mean, the, the vast majority of direct payments users arrange their care responsibly and actually probably better than the council can arrange it. So I, I feel, you know, we should use the experience during COVID around flexibility to promote direct payments more widely, which we still need to do. 
Lovely, thank you. Mike, did you feel any difference in the way the council was approaching flexible use of your direct payment? Did they relax their monitoring processes or are, are they fairly relaxed about it anyway? Uh, if this was a difficult area, how do you think it could have been improved? So I, I didn't say ditto and I support everything to this just said and then try to give a wider context. So I've been involved in direct payment since, you know, have been right the very first direct payment scheme for town habits after the legislation was passed. And I've seen the, exactly the issue that Martin was talking about earlier around erosion of the original principles of direct payments and the autonomy and the choice and control that was originally there. Um, I would say that I don't blame social workers entirely. I largely blame uh, the restriction in resources that are too available and austerity and the fact that social workers have been forced to become gatekeepers. But I think what this exercise has shown us is that by acting quickly, quickly and flexibly, the council managed to avert what could have been a disaster. You know, and by trusting people to come up with the right solutions for themselves with support and guidance, you know, they probably stopped a lot of stress from happening for people. And I think what I'm really looking forward to is how we can continue that dialogue around really, really properly embedding personalization services in social care delivery and personal health budgets and joint packages and yeah, at a wider level, not just health funds, but the other funds that are available to people so that we can somehow take a positive from COVID and say, it's restarted the, the conversation around the value of meaningful choice and control. Brilliant, Mike. Thank you very much. Jackie, on the, on the same issue uh, of, of flexible use, how easy was it for you to get practitioners and finance people behind this key message in your area? Do you think that was the right thing to do? And it, or is this business as usual anyway in Midway? So it's sort of business as usual. Um, I'd say I sort of talk about Kathy and the team, but it is Kathy and the team. And I really want to stress that. So they, you know, and, and prior to Kathy, the team have always actively promoted flexible um, and innovative ways of using direct payments that achieve better outcomes. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not perfect. And there's still a lot that we need to do. And I think... Some of the things that I've seen is trying to it's trying to change the culture of uh, the organisation, but um, I think that being able to demonstrate that it's 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 effective has had some of those changes. So, with regard to the um, the, the pandemic, what we did was where there were sort of obviously different ways of wanting to do things. We Kathy goes back to about the one one point of contact. So we had um, any requests that came through from the diet for so it came through for sort of the way the money could be used, went through the direct, um, sorry, Kathy's team to agree them. Um, and again, the same as um, Denise has said, it was things like employing family members, um, online meditation courses and meditation apps and equipment to keep in touch with families. Um, our view was that we, you know, that client safety was paramount and, and we needed to do what we had to to keep people safe and, and their needs met. Um, and it was also uh, important to support informal carers at home so that, you know, they could get a break from their care and responsibilities. Um, so I go, you know, I go back to what I said, you know, it's something that we do, but we need to continue to work on. Thank you very much. Cathy, anything to add before we open this up uh, for questions beyond me? I don't yeah. I mean I don't mean the questions are beyond me. I mean, yeah, people, yeah. Other, people other than me asking questions. Well, to be honest with you, Pat, I could probably feel the rest of the time if I start speaking again. So um, I'd really no, rather you didn't. <laughs> no, as, as I'll probably, I mean, what Jackie said is pretty much the summary of what it, what it is. As a, it is business as usual. My team, we, we actively promote that um, flexible and innovative way of meeting people's needs. Um, and that sort of kind of, you know, it, it was no different during the COVID. And, and provided we could see how using that money was going to link to the outcome. There was no reason why we wouldn't agree to it. Lovely, thanks. I'm going to hand back to Martin now, I think. Is that right, Martin? 
yeah, I think so, Pat. So, yeah. uh, Thanks. Sorry. First of all, can I thank uh, all four of our participants? I hope everybody found that as interesting and as informative as I, I did. But thank you very much, Mike, Jackie, uh, Catherine and Denise. I thought that was brilliant. And, uh, and, and hopefully they're going to stick around to maybe uh, respond to some of the questions you've got. So, uh, Julie and Isaac, uh, I think you've been helping, and uh, Sally, helping just to watch the chat and see what sort of questions we've got coming in. Can you help us with them? Um, um, Sally, do you want to come in with your question or reflection, first of all? So, um, well, I... I, I um... The overarching chat is about, uh, Melanie asked, can children get a direct payment? And of course the answer is yes. Um, Simon asked, why is the uptake of DP not good for older people? And a lot of people have answered that. And, and yeah, um, and much talk about culture, changing the culture around, um, around the uptake of of direct payments for older people and PA's ID badges. Donna's PA's have had them and have got them. Um, other people's haven't. So Donna seems to be the, um, the the one who knows about the ID um, about the ID badges. Have, Heather has raised her hand. You're on mute, Heather. Oh, there we go. <laughs> So I've been trying to type a comment into the chat box, but I can't really clearly write it as writing without it sounding a little bit like a big on the Hyde Park corner and uh, decided to give a full speech. Um, because um, I um, unluckily <laughs> came out of hospital two weeks before um, before we went into lockdown into a brand new bungalow after spending a year having a debate with the local social services about levels of need and the importance of direct payment and I don't know how many other people have had this conversation you can use your intelligence and you're a very bright person you can do all of these things to make your time work for you and all of this I don't know if I'm preaching to this way, but you know those conversations they quite often have with you. You can make anything work for you. We're going to do this baseline level for And so over the pandemic, even though I should have had a whole series of things done when I came out of the hospital, there seems to have been these conversations on a level of, I don't know if they're intentionally being like they don't understand direct payments and what you can do and how you can combine them, or they just don't understand how they work. So conversations that go, well, you can't have a care agency and a direct payment to use your other seven hours. That's not a thing that can work. I'm going, I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. I'm pretty yeah. sure I read that somewhere. Sure, somebody. It feels like a very, like... Is it intentional malice or if you use cynicism or rather just being this? I don't know. It, yeah, let's, like, let's ask it, one of the, should we ask one of the directors uh, about, about their view about that, about that Heather? Um, um, Denise, what do you think about, about that sort of uh, situation that has uh, just been described? I, I don't think it's intentional in that sense, but I think it's a real missed opportunity if practitioners aren't talking about direct payments in a really positive way. And I always find it disappointing if I get feedback like that, because I think it is such a yeah, lost opportunity to probably put something in place that is much better suited um, to the individual. If I take my director's hat off for 30 seconds, um, I was a, a, a carer recently for my late father-in-law. He just needed some support at, towards the end of his life, last six months. And I really found it difficult, uh, not, not, I don't live in my own authority that I work for, but I really found it difficult to get a direct payment for him. I did get one. It was really hard and challenging and it shouldn't be. And 
that's really the bottom line, isn't it? We've got to make it easier and more consistent for people to access. Great, thank you, Denise. And I think I think that answers Simon's question as well, because he was, you know, as Sally said, he were asking why is this not the case for older people and Sally was explaining for her mum and, and Denise has just explained it as well. And it does seem to be um, that people don't have the information and quite often are discouraged. Um, so even Martin, one of the conveners of, of social care, he had that experience with um, his parents as well, where they said, actually, you don't, when he actually said, well, could we have a direct payment? The uh, older person social worker said, well, you really don't want one of them. It's, it's really hard work. So it was actively disencouraged. Can I, can I just come in on that? Um, yeah. We, it's our habit, as well, so we did run the direct payment support service for 10 years. Um, and I think the reason why we were able to increase the numbers of people on DB so much was because of that peer-led support in understanding what it would mean and how you would go about running it and what the consequences were and what the pros and the cons were and practical solutions to the worries people have. And we found that by a combined approach of answering people's concerns up front and really helping them understand how it could empower them, and simultaneously doing workshops with social workers so that they were less fearful of the issues it meant for them in terms of paperwork or losing control over their casework or whatever, that two-pronged approach was key to driving up the number of people in all age groups, uh, not just younger people, but older people too, and across all impairment types. And I think it just takes like the more progressive social work leaders to, re to value and understand the impact of that independent peer-led support. I think that's responded to John Hislop's question really about sustaining that, John, isn't it? You know, hopefully that can be sustained post-COVID. Um, shall we move to Isaac and Sally? Just going to do a little bit on uh, trying to coordinate or ask people about, um, so what do we do about this? Um, Isaac, do you want to? So for me, listening to everybody online and kind of the national work we've been doing, there seems to be a better deal for people that have a way of co-producing with local citizens. So um, example, Tower Hamlets, Hammersmith, um, and Fulham and other areas where they have really good strong co-production there seems to have been a better deal around the COVID response. I think it's fair to say that co-production is the only way that we can get um, to a place where we're not only promoting direct payments that direct payments are as flexible as um, and supportive to ensure people have the best possible lives. Um, Sally do you want to come in Yeah, and also I think there needs to be a little bit of myth busting for for um, the professionals that work within social care about things like, you know, everyone's defrauding the system, you know, um, as clearly as it's already been said, it's a real, real tiny amount. Um, what we're getting is really good outcomes with direct payments if we're being supported well. Um, and certainly during the COVID, we've heard absolute stories of the the areas that get it right understand co-production and understand the co the, the culture that lies beneath co-production which is about trust and relationships um so yeah Catherine you had this something you wanted to add yes i did um because i absolutely agree where there's co-production there's good outcomes but, um, but equally so, I think um, in Medway, we found that there's been huge value of the team being internal um, and providing that service, providing the team has got the right ethos and the confidence to argue. Because what we find is that we can actually get to speak to the people and uh, that, that can make the decisions where if you've got, if you have an authority that doesn't have good co-production, then you are unable to get that discussion going and, and sort of have your debate as to whether they can use it and how it's going to meet the needs and things like that. So, um, so I think, you know, from Medway's point of view, we've definitely benefited from it being in-house. Thank you, Catherine. And just to reassure everyone, this isn't um, the end of a process. This is the beginning of a journey. So I think more than ever, 
we have demonstrated the value of self-directed support. Personally, I wouldn't have been able to keep safe and well without self-directed support. Um, and I think that we will continue to champion self-directed support. And um, watch out for the inquiry, um, which is really ensuring that the voice of people with lived experience is heard at that. Um, Sally, you're up next introducing Martin. Welcome, Martin. Martin is an absolute veteran of um, self-directed support and direct payments. He's the author of a super, superb book in which he shares his experience of independent living. Um, and he has heard about this issue of non-representation of direct payment recipients and PAs, and so has put his thinking hat on and has formed a new organisation so it's over to Martin to share what his or new organisation is all about. So welcome, Martin, and thank you. Hi, I need to, I'm going to get them through. Hi, Martin's going to get me to speak for him just in the interest of time. Uh, I'm Lucas PA. Yeah. Um, so direct employee, uh, sorry, direct payment employees, the community interest company ran by direct payment employees for direct payment employees. Our aims are to develop a partnership of direct payment employers, often referred to as individual employers or IEs. The purpose of the partnership is to be a collective voice of individual employers at a national level to influence policy and practice around health and social care. And direct payment, yeah, direct payment employers in CIC has already got a Facebook group, which we're very keen to grow and develop, and there's also a plan to develop a website in the new year. We are very much in our infancy and growing. We're firm believers in taking our time and trying to do this right rather than rushing and making mistakes. If you want to know any more, there's contact details on this current slide. Feel free to send us an email. Yeah, feel free to send us an email, preferably. Telephone's not usually the best for us. And there's also a Facebook group you can join. That's pretty much it. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And everyone. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Martin. It's good to see uh, people thinking about uh, what, what's needed for the future. I think William's got his hand up. Have we got time to quickly maybe ask William what you wanted to ask? Yes, Martin. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I agreed um, with um, everybody's points and the way that um, self is support and direct payments um, that seem to be going through the pandemic. I think um, what we, we've been finding in some of the areas of the Northwest of actually um, running the social enterprise that supports disabled people, but also being in a receipt of a uh, personal budget, um, that people have been finding it like difficult to get the information and um, I'm quite lucky to also work alongside Sally on the skills for care paying framework. So we've been feeling that back. Um, I think it's great to hear that many people have been given continuity plans in their budgets when your support matters, the social enterprises done, doing some research at the minute due to COVID. And we've been, we've been finding that um, throughout um, Greater Manchester, you know, has been some like not um, continuing to plans in people's budgets when we ask for freedom of information requests, so it's a bit, bit in hit and miss. So it's great to hear from somebody who's been on a diet of payment for 10 years that we want to make things work better and better change. And the information that I got told 10 years ago is still actually out, out there and mm. you can actually be creative around what you do with your direct um, payment um, when becoming um, supporting a person or assistant or supporting any other person. So yeah, that's what I really wanted to Thanks. say. Thanks, William. I, I think we'll be really interested in the, the outcome of your, of your research when, when, it's, uh, when it's ready. We'll be yeah. really interested to, to, to hear about that. Um, Julie. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid, yeah, the time's just crept away. Aye, and I know absolutely. That there are people who wanted to ask um, 
much more to talk about. There's a lunch and chat link if people mm -hmm. want to go to that. Yeah. Certainly if we um, do a session like this, I think it needs to be a two hour one so that mm -hmm. we can have a break and come back and have a really good chat through. Um, Monza, I know what one of your questions are, but I will pick up and we will find a way of, of getting that question somewhere, even if it's not in this session. So just be reassured. And if anybody else has anything burning, either drop us an email, pop it in the chat now and I'll pick it up and we'll try and get it picked up within the next day or so. But thank you ever so much, Martin, for facilitating, Isaac, Sally, Pat. Thank you so much to guest speakers, uh, Denise, Jackie, Catherine and Mike. And thank you for coming. And the lunch uh, link is in the chat if you want to carry on. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.